hello everybody. Uh, I'm not just talking to people online. We've got people here in the building. This is Center City Church in downtown Greensboro. Uh, and we are back for week two of our revival-focused Bible study. My name is Frank Mickens, and uh, I'm with Faith Fire Worldwide Revival Ministries, where our mission is to stir up and fan, uh, fan the flame of revival around the world. And this is part of how that works, is uh, basically going to God's Word and taking a deeper look at what it means to be in relationship with the Father. So that's what we're going to do. We talked a lot about that last week. We're going to continue on this week, and I think that it's going to bless your soul. It's going to encourage you, particularly in this pandemic season that we're in, when I think all of us need some peace. Uh, I'm going to ask all the folks in here, if you want to come closer, you're fine. I know we're social distancing, but if you want to come closer, you're more than happy to do that. You're not going to be in view. Um, I kind of like that, too. You know, it makes it feel more intimate, but it's up to you. Um, so a, a big shout out real quick before we pray to Pastor Dan Colvin and his wife and the whole staff here at Center City Church. It is such a privilege to be here and um, have this space. And I mean, the surroundings here are, are certainly, um, I don't know if there's a word for it. Um, it it's, uh, immerse, it's immersing. You feel the presence of God in this place. You can even smell it. So the atmosphere is prime for this. Let us take a moment now and pray before we uh, get into the word of God. Uh, Father, in, our, in your name, Jesus, we come, uh, not in our own name, but we come knowing that we're children of the King of Kings. We are excited. We are hungry. We are thirsty. Many of us are coming with needs. Many of us are coming with anxieties, frustrations. Things are happening in our lives, God. You know life happens. But something that you want us to get today is that you're always there and that you're showing us ways that we can find you, even in the midst of a storm. There are ways that we can find you in the midst of confusion. We can find you when everyone else in the world seems to be not getting it. But you can connect with us. It's just the way we view things and how we make room for you. So, Lord, we pray that you illuminate the word of God right now. Take control of my mind and my mouth, Lord God. Uh, I want to speak as the oracle of God right now to encourage your people. And we want to see fire in our lives. And we believe it will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So a uh, real quick recap last week. Let me see if I can, if I can give you a summation. Uh, last week we talked about knowing the heart of the Father. We talked a lot about the story that Jesus uh, was very um, critical as a, as a character uh, where you had Martha and Mary, these sisters, and Jesus comes to Martha's house. So picture that. Jesus comes to your house. And there were two different postures that were exhibited in that particular story. Martha was concerned about stuff. She wanted to cook. She wanted things to be clean. She wanted things to be prim and proper because Jesus is here. But Mary instead sat at Jesus' feet and he was the only thing that she put her focus and attention and her emotions on. She invested in him as opposed to thinking about what all the things of the world were requiring of her at that moment. Something that her sister Martha couldn't understand. Martha goes to Jesus and says, aren't you going to tell her to come help me? And Jesus' response was a key to the lesson last week when he said, one thing is necessary. And Mary has found that good part, that good thing. And he was talking about himself. And so if we make priority for Jesus, we talked about making room for Jesus, we talked about uh, creating a space in our home that we reserve just for the Lord. We went into Song of Solomon where we talked about this dance that uh, is exhibited in the Song of Solomon between the beloved and uh, 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 the, the king or the prince. And how this dance was being um, rhythmically and symphonically and orchestrally described, poetically described as romantic literature to set the tone for the way that we should view our relationship with the Savior. Jesus Christ came so that we could have communion. We talked about in the book of John when he, uh, he's the resurrected Savior and the disciples were, they were caught up in the fact that he wasn't there with them in, in, in the physical and they were disappointed and they, they, they started questioning if he was who, they, who he says he was, who they believed he was. And here he is on the shore and he says, come and dine with me. And he sat down with them and they ate together. And we talked about the book of Esther where Asuerus, the king, is a representation of the father's heart. And he bids his, his queen to come into the throne room. And, and he says, I will give you whatever you ask for up to half of the kingdom. And we talked about how that's the father's heart. Many of us have been raised, taught, 
uh, misunderstood that God is a judge and judge only. Yes, he's a judge. He's all about righteousness. He's all about making sure that we are protected from each other. We're protected from sin, which is the real problem. We're protected from the opposition of the enemy, the devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So, yes, he's all about that. But in there, there is relationship. And we do not preach a fear-based gospel. We don't preach the gospel that says, okay, if you don't come to Jesus, you're going to hell. The gospel message is, he says, if anyone believes in him, they shall not perish and have everlasting life. And that everlasting life begins at salvation. It's not something we wait for in heaven. He comes to give us relationship now. He comes to give us access now. He comes just like the king and says, come in with me. Come and sit with me. There's so many metaphorical examples of that. And one more thing from last week that I found to be astounding, and that is in the book of Exodus chapter 24. I believe it's verse 9. Uh, matter of fact, we'll go there real quick, and I think it sets the tone for what we're going to talk about today. This is the standard. This is where God wants us to be. Uh, the book of Exodus. I'm in Genesis right now. I'm going to turn to Exodus. Uh, Exodus 24. And the elders, these are the leaders of, of Israel. It says Moses, Aaron, a man named Nadab, and Abihu, and also, in addition to those, you had 70 elders of Israel. And in verse 10, Exodus 24, it says they all saw the God of Israel. Whoa! This is before the Ten Commandments. <laughs> this is before Jesus Christ. And the, the Lord God in physical form, Jesus, this is a pre-incarnate Jesus, invites these 74, 75 people, if you think Joshua was there as I do, to come and see him. And, it, and in this scripture, it talks about how he looked. They beheld him. Look at this. It says there were under his feet like paved work of sapphire stone. And his body was like heaven in its clearness. It's talking about the glory uh, of the beauty of God. Al, can you do me a favor? This thing seems to have slipped. Can you um, tilt it up a little bit? My hand is getting cut off. No, do it from the little. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Now you can see me. Thanks, Al. It's good. I don't know what happened. Um, so here we see the ideal and it says, not only did they see God, this is on Mount Sinai. This is before the 40, near, 40 years in the wilderness. They sat with the Lord. They saw the Lord. And it says he didn't lay his hand on them. So they had no reason to be afraid. You know, because the idea of God is he's so holy. Oh my gosh, I'm going to disintegrate. Well, the Lord wants to invite us in. He made a way for us to be invited into that closeness and still be able to abide in him. And then it says... They ate and drank with the Lord. Holy Spirit. So that's the, that's the, that's the standard. That's what Jesus came to, uh, to the earth to die and, and rise for us, to give us that access. All right? Um, Al, do me a favor. Come back. It's slipping again. You might need to tighten it. You see that little dial there on the side? On the side, on the other side. Yep, that one. Tighten that. Is it tight? Yeah. Now we're good. Don't you love live stream? This is live, y'all. Good stuff. It should not move now. We're going to find out. So that's the recap from last week. Uh, so let's talk about this week. Last week, we're talking about the heart of the Father and how that's why Jesus came to remind us of what we just saw in Exodus 24. He did not come to change anything. He came to confirm what had already been revealed. And what we see in Scripture is... Uh, the Israelites grew up thinking so much about rules. They were so concerned about getting things right when actually Jesus comes and he's like, wait a minute. All of you are telling people they're wrong. They couldn't do this, but you don't have any relationship. I don't know you. This is what we hear Jesus say in Matthew chapter 7. He says, all of you guys are saying all this great stuff about who you are and what you've done, but I don't know you. He came for us to know him and for us to be known. So let's talk a little bit more about that. I'm going to speak to you from this thought, and that is hide and seek, hide and seek. And you might be wondering, OK, you know, why would God hide from me? Well, let me let me just kind of uh, lay some groundwork in the Bible. In the book of Jeremiah, the Lord describes our heart condition. He says our hearts are desperately wicked. So so my default position is wicked, like I'm going to have desires that are not good for me. And so since he knows our hearts, he's figured out a way. Let me scoot back some. That thing's still slipping. 
But I'm just going to adjust. Al, you don't have to worry about it. I think I'm just going to adjust. Well, maybe you do need to worry about it. Holy Spirit, protect us from this uh, technological snafu. Um, I think it's okay. So, um, thank you, Holy Spirit. So, look, we're going to talk about hide and seek. You might wonder, why hide and seek? Well, God knows our hearts are desperately wicked. We, we, we earnestly desire things that we, we just can't help but want. And they're not good for us. And the thing that's so cool about God is he's the only one who knows what's good for us on any given day at any given moment. And even though he's given us the free will to choose, he's also opened the door for us to know the right choice to make. And it comes again through relationship. So what we want to talk about, you know, this is a revival based Bible study. What we've come to talk about is a revived relationship. It's not something that we conjure. It's not something we manufacture. It's not something we manipulate. You don't manipulate God. All you need to do is access him. And he does that through hide and seek. Now, how do we know this? Let me give you an example. Let's go back to Song of Solomon. And I, I just described it in a way that I, I'm trying my best to describe it with words. Just the way the Song of Solomon uses this musical, rhythmic, poetic um, verbiage to, to describe this dance between God and us. Um, and that's, what, that's really what it is. It's a, it's a dance. Um, give me one second. I'm going to switch chairs. Um, it's, a, it's a dance. And this dance is geared toward bringing us closer to him. The hide and seek is not meant to keep us at arm's length. The hide and seek is to make us desire him more and more and more. And I think about a scavenger hunt. You know, if you know there's a whole lot of different treasures out there, finding one is not going to make you say, all right, I'm done, I'm going to go home. You're going to be like, well, there's more out there. And so what God does, you know, the Bible talks about how it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of God to hide things. And then it says it's the glory of kings to search it out. Well, we are kings and priests in the kingdom of God. And I want to invite you into that relationship. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, it's really simple. You just say, okay, I know I can't. I'm not going to heaven without some help. And Jesus Christ, okay, you died for my sins. You took my punishment. I'm going to give that a try. I'm going to receive that for myself. Um, here, I'm going to come up here and fix this because I can't go any farther. I think this thing is uh, its going to cooperate. I think I fixed it. It's not sleeping anymore. All right. Um, so this dance is so critical because when he's hiding something, he's doing it so that we can seek it out. So God is not like, you know, someone who's hiding something in a safe and he doesn't want anybody to discover it. He's hiding it for it to be discovered. What is he hiding? Himself. He's hiding the depth of who he is. He's hiding the peace, the love, the joy. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have peace, you don't have love, joy. But there are depths that we can reach that are deeper. He is a, a well of living water. Water that is alive is always replenishing. Water that is alive is always moving. Water that is alive is always nourishing. Water that is alive is never stagnant. It doesn't, things inside of moving water don't die. That's why it's called living water. And so he wants us to continually get a drink from him. And he knows that if he doesn't hide himself, we're going to just say, oh, I've arrived. I am a superhuman, supernatural, spirit-filled Christian. I don't need any God. I don't need to pray anymore. And that is false, and it leads to destruction. Because pride is what started all this. The pride of Satan is why we have sin in the world. God has to keep us humble. God has to keep us humble. So let's talk about Song of Solomon real quick. I am so excited to show you this. Song of Solomon, chapter 3. And I'll just say this. As a Christian... I am just now recently getting into Song of Solomon because of what the Lord is revealing about why it exists. It exists so that we can continually see the depth of his heart for us. I mean, he goes into detail earlier in the Song of Solomon talking about how, how the Lord looks at the temp, our temples and, and describes our temples as beautiful. I mean, I've never, I mean, I'm married and I, I can honestly say I've never taken note of my wife's temples. I mean, this, it, where does a temple end and, and begin? And, and so when Jesus says that the Lord knows how many hairs on your head, 
these are nuggets of his affection. And that's why I'm so excited because when you talk about a revival, we're not talking about, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to just get a frothy, you know, get worked up. No, you want to melt. This is a melting. He's a consuming fire. The point is you want to fall into God and he, he's enveloping you and you become one. Jesus said in John 17, he says, the glory you've given me, Father, I've given them so that they may be one as you and I are one and you and I, they might be one in you. He wants us to be so intricately intertwined with him that we take on his nature. That is revival. I mean, this is, it's not like boot camp. When you go and you enter another world and they've got to work it out of you. They've got to like scream at you and force you to shave your head and everyone's got to become monolithic because who, you know, how else are you going to learn obedience unless we force it on you and do it really quick, make you drink from a fire hose and now you've been transformed. Military does a great job of that. I'm not decrying how they do it. I mean, look, if you get me in a room with about 50 men, I'm going to have to find some ways to whip them into shape, too, to get on the same page. But in the kingdom of God, he grows his army, his family. He grows his family by his kindness. He draws, him, he draws us to his heart through his love and affection for us. And it's so indelibly different than anything else that you will experience he makes you keep coming back for more. All right, so let's go to Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon and see how this works. And we're going to read just the first, um, five verses, okay? Now, I'm going to read the King James Version, so I'm going to sound like a highfalutin, you know, very intellectual person without the English accent, but there's a reason for that. Song of Solomon 3, verse 1, By night on my bed I sought him, whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I found him not. She's seeking him and cannot find him. Now let's stop right there. So, so I want you to feel okay about this. God has let you off the hook. If there ever has been a time when you felt like you did not sense, could not feel, could not discern, could not access the presence of God, if you've never felt like you have, it's okay. It's okay. There's a reason why you're here right now. He's going he's gonna to unveil why that is, okay? Verse 2, I will rise now. So she makes a decision. I didn't find him, but I'm going to rise now, and I'm going to go about the city in the streets. And in the broad ways, I will seek him who my soul loves. I sought him, but I found him not. So it's not as simple sometimes as seeking and you're going to find him immediately. Now, we know the words of Jesus. He says, asking you shall receive, seeking you will find, knocking it shall be open. But he didn't say immediately. Remember now, he's dealing with desperate, desperately wicked hearts. He's got to get our heart condition uh, softened. And he does it. By getting us to decide to want him more than the other things that have made our hearts hard. Oh, somebody needs to praise him. So, so, so when, when things happen to us that might frustrate us, a lot of times that's the Lord giving us the ingredients to turn away from those things that are not satisfying so that we'll have a reason to turn toward him. Coronavirus is a prime example of how God on a global scale is awakening people to turn to him. It's so dissatisfying to, to, to have days when you wake up in the morning and you can't find people to agree on even what it is. Is it manufactured? Is it man-made? Is it what is stable anymore? Our kids are learning over video. I know someone who says his kids are done with school in 60 minutes every day. This is nothing like we've ever experienced, but what is it for? I'm going to get to that in a little bit. Don't let me forget to take you to Mark chapter, uh, chapter 4. Um, but real quick, she saw him twice and didn't find him. Then verse 3, look at this. The watchmen who go about the city found me. And I said to them, did you see him who my soul loves? So now she's saying, I tried to look for him in my bed in the night. 
I got up and I went into the street looking for them, still didn't find them. Now I'm asking other people whose job it is to be watching. And I'm asking, have you seen them? So she is, she is desperately seeking the Lord. The Bible says, in, uh, Jeremiah says, seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. That sounds unfair. But let me remind you that if you do not do it wholeheartedly, it's not going to change anything. Because the, the stony stuff in your heart that you prioritize above God is still enslaving you. And you are not a slave. You are a child of the king. And so for him to awaken you to who you are, sometimes he exposes the things that are keeping us from him by hiding from us. I'll give you a personal example. My career was an idol. Ordained in 2008, director of evangelism, outreach director, trainer of evangelism. I would go into Walmart one in the morning, lay hands, pray. I was doing the stuff. But there was a time in my life the Lord had to reveal to me by my dissatisfaction. And I'm crying out to God, what is it? Years. Years I was crying out to the Lord. What is it, Lord? I'm not, there's something, the peace is not there. What is it? And finally I heard him because I was at a point where I was willing to give it up. And I said, what is it, Lord? Whatever it is. He said, you've made money an idol. And I said, it's yours. Take it. I put it on the altar. It's over. And that's why I quit TV. And so I found my identity for this season of my life by hide and seek. He's hiding and I'm looking, what is it, God? And I'm, I, look, I was meeting with pastors. I'm calling people. My wife and I talk. What is it? Watchmen. The other people. I'm like, look, what is it that is standing in, the, in my way of finding his heart? She asked the watchman. Now watch this. She says, uh, a little bit after that, she says, I left them, but I found him who my soul loves. No one else found him for her. She found him by her desperate need. And it says, I held him and would not let him go until I brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her who conceived me. She was determined to bring him home. She didn't just say, okay, it's good enough to me, for me to know about him. Now, some of us, I've been this person, have been satisfied with knowing about God. Some of us have salvation, and we've said, I know Jesus Christ is my Savior, but we don't know him because either we've never been taught or we're so busy. Look at this woman. She, in the middle of the night, she's looking for him. She goes out into the street, she's looking for him. She's at, at no point did she consult her daytimer. At no point did she say, well, all right, I'm going to get to this later because I've got food on the stove. She dropped everything because her soul was not satisfied. Her, it, she described her soul as the soul that loves him. Now, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. These are things that are left up to God to redeem. Because our, our natural mind, our natural will, and our natural emotions get caught up in the worldly things around us. When Jesus says things like, turn the other cheek, he's dealing with our soul. He's trying to show us your, your mind and your will and your emotions want to retaliate. And some of us can't find it in our hearts to turn the other cheek because we have a deeper level of knowing him that's required to empower us to do it. And so he hides. So he allows us to bump our heads against a wall 16 times, 1600 times, whatever it takes for us to find him. And this is why you can't get mad at God. Think about the two thieves that were next to Jesus Christ. They had spent their whole lives out of relationship with God to the point where the fruit of their lives had brought them to the death penalty. So they were criminals. Everyone agrees that they were criminals. But one of them, in the midst of the mocking, the beating, the bleeding, he recognized that Jesus was different. And he determined to know Jesus. Think about that. 
He, his entire life never knew. But because of the difficulty he faced in that moment, he could now see who Jesus was. It took who knows how many times for the Lord to try to reveal himself to that one particular man. And he still knew he was worth saving even at the last minute. Now, I'm not claiming for you that that's what's going to happen. That was supposed to encourage you for you to understand that he never gives up. He never gives up. So, yeah, when they say that Jesus comes after you like the one who leaves the 99 and goes after the one that he absolutely does that. However, many of us, we need to have difficulty just like the prodigal son. That father, he waited. He had to stay where he was so that that prodigal son could experience how it feels to be outside of the relationship with the father. For him to have a moment of clarity and say, whoa, everything I need is in my father's house. So that soul, that mind, will, and emotions, he knows how to bend it to his, to his will. He knows. The problem becomes, will we let our will supersede his? He gives, us the, he gives us the ability to choose. I can choose to stay where I am. And he'll continue to let difficulty come. He'll continue to let Satan buffet you because he knows he's got to get your heart to surrender. We're going to look at that in a second. So searching, searching, searching is important. Let me give you three words that are very important. And we're going to talk about uh, the book of Mark. And then we're going to go to uh, the book of Genesis. Um, Three words I want you to just pinpoint and bookmark. Wrestle, settle, and nestle. Wrestle, settle, and nestle. You could call that a continuum for relationship with God. I'm going to show you that in just a second. But let me show you the wrestling portion real quick as it pertains to scripture in Mark 4, verse 35. This is a very very much quoted scripture and the Lord gave me a deeper revelation about it for, for the purposes of why we're here today getting into deeper relationship with him so this is where Jesus calms the storm I'm going to read here King James Version Mark 4 35 it says the same day when evening came he said to them let us pass over to the other side so his, his disciples were with him and when they had sent away the multitude they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were other little ships with them. So he had the main ship where it was Jesus and his uh, apostles. And then other ships were around him. Now, around all these ships, it says in verse 37, there arose a great storm of wind and waves beating into the ship so that it was now full. Full of what? Water. Full of water. And it says Jesus in verse 38 was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow and they woke him up and said master do you not care that we perish and he arose and rebuked the wind and he said to the sea peace be still the wind ceased and there was a great calm and he said to them why are you so afraid how is it that you have no faith and they feared exceedingly and said to one another what manner of man is this that even the wind and sea obey him Frank what are you getting at here's the deal who, who was Jesus mad at when he said, peace be still? You know, it's described in other translations with exclamation points that he was, he was upset. Now, was he upset with the wind and the sea? I'm going to say he wasn't. I'm going to say he was upset because he knew the pregnancy of the moment. He wanted them to trust him so much that it didn't matter what was going on around them. He wanted them to have a, a revelation of the relationship they had with him and how it was impossible for anything in their environment to supersede his love. And he was upset because when they even saw him asleep at rest in the middle of this storm that was filling the ship, that they couldn't discern, well, if you're at rest, I should be at rest. Let me now behold your rest and receive the rest you have for myself. Many of us are living life like this. Now watch this, the storm, wind and waves, that's the spirit of God. So we just talked about wrestling. We talked about how he allows things to make us uncomfortable. The spirit of God, he allows the spirit of God to stir up stuff in our lives. And he does it to provoke us to come to him. So they did the right thing by coming to him. 
But instead of them saying, wow, teach me how to be at peace like you're at peace. They instead say, no, change the situation. The ship was filling up with water, the spirit of God. So the point of the storm is to fill us with what we otherwise would not be able to receive if, if life was just normal, if life was just escape. And so he's upset because he knew the missed opportunity they had to get a deeper understanding of their relationship with the one who, yes, does command the winds and waves to obey him. And I love the fact that it says that there were other little ships. Why? We don't know anything about what was going on with the other little ships because those were, in this story's context, those were the quote-unquote outsiders. They were not the ones who were closest to Jesus. He wants us to focus on the ones who were closest to him, the ones who should have, in his opinion, and Jesus is obviously saying this when he's saying, why are you so fearful? He's saying, I've been with you this long and you don't see what you have in me. John 15 says, abide in me and, and let my word abide in you, right? He wants us to receive him, the word, the living word, so that we may abide in him. And there's a transference of that peace, of that love, of all the fruit of the spirit, goodness, self-control, patience, all of these things. So he allows the spirit to work stuff up around us so that we can have an opportunity to be filled with these gifts that the spirit can give us. But we can't. We can't try to abandon ship. We got to stick it out. And I know many of us are going through all kinds of anxiety right now. And this is prime position. It's prime position for you to behold him that even now he's with you. That even now he's close. That even now he's at peace. That even now he's still in control. That even now you can come to him and ask him. That even now he will do what you ask Whatever that's required to bring you revelation about who he is. So even though he was upset that they missed the depth of relationship that they could have apprehended, he still wanted to confront their unbelief so that they could grow from it. This is the mercy of our God. He didn't punish them. You know, some of us, I think we get caught up like, oh, well, you know, I see other people who seem to have, you know, such a deep relationship with God and, and we're comparing ourselves to them. And what the root of that is, is fear. There's no fear in his love. So really, what I hope you can do is you can say, wow, certainly I want to have that kind of relationship that I see that person has. Two things you need to know. One, you don't know how that person came to get that relationship. Trust me, it came through suffering. Trust me, it came through trials and tribulations. Trust me, it came through doubt. It came through storms. Secondly, it's not something to covet. It's something to behold. It's a witness. It's a witness to his goodness. So all the people in the little ships had a great story that they got when they got to the other side. The apostles were able to go and tell these cats, listen, let me tell you what just happened. There's a witness that comes from those who are close to the Lord. So if that's, if that's let's just assume that's you. This is what God, the purpose of this is. It's not to just have you be a glutton of his presence. It's for you to not just receive, but also be a witness so others' lives can be transformed through what you've experienced in his presence. I hope somebody gets something out of that. Praise be to God. All right, so let's go to our last uh, segment of scripture. I might end a little early tonight. Let's see. Um, let's go to Genesis chapter 28. We're going to talk about our friend Jacob. And uh, I did give you a, a word earlier, wrestle. We know uh, Jacob wrestled, so we're going to get to that in a second. But let's look at Jacob uh, when he was a little bit younger. Before he came into the knowledge of, of wrestling with God. You know, it takes, it takes some courage to wrestle with God. So how did he get there? Let's do a little backstory. So Jacob, we know, um, was a trickster. Jacob was a twin. His brother Esau. He tricked Esau out of his birthright. He tricked Esau out of his inheritance. He manipulated his way toward blessing. He, he manipulated his way toward what was already ordained for him to receive. Because remember, his mother knew when he was born because the Lord had told her that the younger was actually going to receive the inheritance. So he didn't have to manipulate his life. He didn't have to do so much work to get to, to what God had for him. But because he hadn't come to that knowledge and God is merciful, God allowed him to receive it the way that he thought it was going to work out. But it brought him stress because he, got, he had to leave his family. He had to leave his family and go to a foreign land by himself. 
He was, he was uh, separated from his brother. He was afraid of his brother. He thought his brother was going to kill him. Imagine waking up every morning not knowing if your brother's going to show up and kill you. That's not peace. So God had a deeper level of him that he needed to give to Jacob. So he allowed the storm. He allowed Jacob to work himself up into this situation. But watch what happens to Jacob. God gives him a first fruit offering of his goodness. In Genesis chapter 28, let's go to verse 11. So here he is. Jacob has left his family. He's by himself. And it says, that he, uh, verse 11, he lighted upon a certain place and he tarried there or waited there all night because the sun was set. And he took up the stones of that place and put them for pillows and he laid down in that place to sleep. I find it amazing that he could sleep on stones. Keep that in mind. So verse 12, and he dreamed and behold, a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to the heaven and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Let me get this thing back because I got to get to this point. It's this phone slipping. Um, so here we have Jacob, you know, he's running from his brother. He's all alone and he has a dream. He sees a ladder and it says on this ladder, the angels were ascending and descending. And then it says the Lord stood above the ladder. So here we are. He sees God and he speaks to him. He says, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father and the God of Isaac, the land where you are lying to you. will I give it and to your descendants. So let's skip down to verse 16. So he, he's, he's, he's been laying on a rock. He somehow found rest in this place. And now he hears the, the voice of God. And he says in verse, it says in verse 10 that, verse 16, Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. Wow. This was an awakening indeed. It says he awake, awoke from his sleep. And he said, the Lord is in this place and I didn't know it. Frank, what are you saying? Well, I'm speaking to somebody right now. You're going to have a dream or a vision. The Lord's going to visit you. He's going to, he's going to um, confirm and affirm this word in your life. Let's just say that now. I prophesy that to someone. Also, God knew what he had in Jacob. He knew Jacob's heart. He knew that Jacob was tired of running. <laughs> he knew that Jacob was tired of the stress. He knew that Jacob was tired of not knowing God. He was trying to do all this stuff with his own strength, his own intellect, his own. And he still wasn't set free from it in this moment. But he knew that if he could um, awaken Jacob to who he was, that he had an inheritance that was just for him and that it had generational impact. Come on, somebody. He knew if he could awaken him to that, that he would seek him. Oh, Jesus, the hide and seek is back. So God could have at that moment, if he thought it was proper, he could have said, OK, walk with me now, Jacob, and I'm going to speak to you audibly every day for the rest of your life. That's not what he did. He gave Jacob a first fruit offering, a taste of his goodness, a taste of his promises, a taste of that which uh, Jesus, we know, came to die for all of us to receive. That is the goodness, the glory, the majesty, the presence of God. He gave him a taste of it so that he won it again. And it started with him finding rest in where he was. He, it, it, where he was, with all the junk, he just determined, you know what? I'm going to rest right now. I don't know how. I'm just going to get these stones. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to get me some rest. And he fell into a type of rest that the Lord could enter. And he could hear the Lord and receive what the Lord was saying. So let's go ahead and in case that's you, that's okay. If you're a person who's never felt, I've said this before, you've never felt like you have experienced the presence of God, that's okay. It was a day for you to be here right now. Also, it's normal. You know, when you spend years of your life living a certain way, you're not all of a sudden just going to say, whoop, voila, I figured out God. Wait a minute. This is the God that is described in Scripture, in scripture as being unsearchable. So even if we spent every moment of every day doing just God, we would never get to the bottom of him. And all of us have our own spiritual DNA. The Bible says we each have the measure of faith that the Lord has given us for what he needs us to do in this world. 
And so you don't need to worry about, oh, what was me? If I had known then what I know now, no, man, this is, this is the best time to be alive. Because it's this kind of teaching that's going out into the earth right now where people realize God is not a fear-based, fear-mongering God. He's not a God that's sitting around, you know, ready to wrap your knuckles when you make a mistake. No, he's a loving father that says, come sit in my lap. Tell me what happened today. How can I soothe you? Yes, I'm going to correct you. I'm going to show you what you could have done, should have done, and what you're not going to do again. Yes, absolutely. We're going to do that in relationship. Don't forget the people in Exodus. After Exodus 24, where they dined with God, those same elders went down to the bottom of the mountain and they made a golden calf. These are the guys who saw the pre-incarnate Christ. That's our heart condition, y'all. These guys sat and ate a meal with Jesus Christ on a mountain and physically beheld his glory and they still had the heart capability, the capacity of the sinful nature to go right back down the mountain after already hearing a trumpet blast, after already having an earthquake, after already seeing a cloud, after already seeing the Red Sea parted, after all the plagues, they still had the capacity to have an idol. That's why he has to hide. We are innately messed up. And he loves it. He loves it. He redeemed us. That's why he redeemed us, because he sees us better than himself. He literally see, he exalts us. I know that's going to mess with somebody's theology, but it's literally what he did. He could have wiped us out after Noah and said, you know what, forget it. I tried, I wiped it out. Noah's folk couldn't get it right either. We're done. But he sees the value in us that we don't see in ourselves that he can't even put words to. He had to show himself on a cross to give us an idea. He had to show himself bleeding Dying, suffering for you, for you to get an idea of how he thinks about you and how he exalts you. That's the heart of the father. It's not a father that has parochial punishment for everything you do wrong. Absolutely not. So let me show you. Uh, we talk about wrestling, settling, and nestling. Watch this. Uh, we're in Genesis chapter 32. I love this scripture because it's so chock full of mystery. I think we could study this scripture for the rest of our days and still never reach bottom. And just dig, 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 dig into the ways and thoughts of God. His ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. They're not like ours. And so it's a, it's a lifelong expedition trying to excavate some of these treasures in the word of God. And this one, I mean, it really gets my attention. Um, I'll hit that phone just straighten it up real quick it, it's still okay but it just needs a little adjustment there you go i'm not going to get that one this next time i'm going to get a different tripod uh so we're in genesis uh, 32 and let me catch it up a little bit so we already knew that he was running from esau we already knew he had taken his birthright he had stolen his inheritance so then he went and he decided okay i'm going to go i'm going to get married so he'd been tricked he got a dose of his own medicine so laban the man who he went to and he found Rachel, a woman who he loved. He got tricked into marrying her sister Leah. He worked seven years for her. Then, for some reason, I guess because he was just so deeply in love with Rachel, he agreed to work an additional seven years to get Rachel's hand. So now he's got two wives. One wife's enough, but he's got two wives. And on top of that, he had to work another six years in order to get cattle from Laban. So he works for his father-in-law. I don't know about you. Not everybody can work for their father-in-law. But this brother worked for his father-in-law for 20 years. And even then, where we find him right now is when he left Laban in secret because he was afraid that if he told Laban the truth, I got to get out of here, that Laban wouldn't let him leave. So here he is now still manipulating. Here he is still trying to do this thing with his own strength. Here he is not seeking the Lord. This is the same one who saw a ladder and at the top of it was God himself. His heart was desperately wicked. <laughs> so the Lord had to hide and let him go through some more stuff, get a dose of his own medicine, work 20 years hard labor in the desert for your father-in-law with two wives. The wife you love can't have children, so she's despised by the one that you, do, you don't love, and you got infighting, you got tension. My God, his life was, I mean, somebody dial up Joyce 
What's the, what's the, what's the, uh, the, the, George Meyer, George somebody, get a teacher, somebody can, you know, soothe this man. Um, long story short, he was wrestling. He couldn't, he had not yet found what he discovered at Bethel. That was Genesis 28. Bethel means house of God. When he, when he acknowledged this is a place where God is, he named it Bethel, which means the house of God. He had not yet found the house of God yet. Now, let me give you a secret. You are the house of God. The house of God is not a church building. The house of God was, was not just at Bethel. It was everywhere. God is everywhere. And he had to teach Jacob that even after he left that part of his journey, that he was still with him. He thought, oh, that was a one-off. God spoke to me and told me, oh, he's the same God of my grandfather, my father, and I'm going to get an inheritance. It's great. Now I'm just going to walk this thing out by myself. Not true. Not true for you either. When you came to Jesus, got baptized, that was just the beginning of everlasting life. It gets better, 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 better. He makes all things new. Every day is new. Every experience is new. Everything is new. He wants to make your prayers new every day. He wants to make everything you do new, refreshing. So he was still wrestling to get back to Bethel in his heart. He had that, he had that experience, but he just couldn't get back there. So God had hidden to stir up a desire. Watch what happens to Jacob's heart. Um, Al, he hit it one more time. It's slipping. I'm going to get through this quick so we don't have to worry about this again. Bear with us. Praise the Lord. All right. So um, Genesis 32, verse 22. And it says, Jacob rose up that night. He took his two wives, took his women servants and his 11 sons. He passed over the ford Jabbok. He took them and sent them over the brook and sent over all he had. So here he is alone again. If you remember the last time he was alone, he had an experience. Well, he's about to have another experience. Jacob was left alone, and there he wrestled a man until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he did not prevail against him, the man touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. And Jacob said, I will not let you go except you bless me. This is not the same Jacob. He had gotten a taste of God's goodness. He had a feeling that this was another one of those moments that he couldn't get. He was not going to let this one go until he got everything out of it. And the thing that Jacob had to learn and what we all need to continually relearn is it's not a thing we're after. It's a person. God himself came to Jacob. Jacob caught a hold of God and said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. Look at what God says. He says, what is your name? You think God asked that because he didn't know his name? Of course he didn't. He wanted Jacob to declare his nature. He says, my name is Jacob. Well, Jacob means trickster. He wanted Jacob to say out of his own mouth who he was without God. But then God says, here's who you really are. He said, your name shall not be Jacob anymore, but Israel, for as a prince, you have power with God and with men and you have prevailed. Listen to this. He calls him a prince. Did you know you were royalty when you come to Christ? Do not let somebody sell, someone sell you short of who you are in Christ. Don't do it. Don't do it. Here, I'm going to come up here. Don't come. You don't have to worry about it. Don't let anyone sell you short of who you are. He said, I know who you are without me. Try to hit it one more time now. I know who you are without me. You're a trickster without me because you're operating in your own strength. You're operating in your own knowledge. You're operating in your own wisdom. Yeah, that is who you are without me. But let me tell you who you really are. Your name is Israel, one who wrestles with God. And all of us are called to do that. He welcomes us. Did he rebuke Jacob for wrestling with him? No, he did not. What he did was he touched Jacob and he disabled him. Whoa, what does that represent? The brokenness that we have to receive. And the only way you can receive the brokenness is in his presence. It's when you behold him in light of you. When you're sitting with him, you're communing with him, you're just there. You're not going to get anything. You're not going because you want to raise. You're not going because you're sick. Maybe you do that. I'm not saying you shouldn't. What I'm saying is there's a higher, there's a him. God himself, 
when, when he says Bethel, you're the house of God, he wants to be in you. He wants you to be his dwelling place. And so coming to him, the primary reason is for you to receive him, to receive the gift. What, is, what did Jesus say? He says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, on the surface, we know that could represent Jesus because he even said, this is my body, which is broke for you, the bread. Yes, the body of Jesus on the cross. Certainly, we need to behold what he did for us. But Jesus himself, he's still alive. <laughs> when he says, give us this day our daily bread, he's talking about the manna from heaven, from the wilderness, how every day they woke up and they got sustenance from the manna. He was he was talking about that concept that every single day and the, and you know in the old testament they only let you get so much manna at a time you only got enough for that day only he wants to hide again so you can come back again and get more he never wants you to be satisfied because remember your heart is desperately sinful he knows if you ever get satisfied you're going to start walking through life thinking you're your own god and that's detrimental that's detrimental so wrestling, settling. So we know he wrestled, but he settled. When he said, I won't let you go until you bless me. This was after the Lord hit his thigh and disabled him. And there was a point where he couldn't fight anymore. That's the settling. Then there's the nestling. So you wrestle with God. You finally settle and say, I cannot continue to kick against the pricks. Like he said to Paul, like, why are you kicking? Him? You can't win. Once you realize you can't beat him. Jacob comes in and says, tell me, what is your name? Why is it that you ask my name? And God said, and God blessed him there. And then Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. He says, because I have seen God face to face. I have seen God face to face. Bless the Lord. This word's going to go out. It's going to go out. All right. That should help. Um, so what happened was Jacob realized that there was, no, there was no point fighting anymore. So he, he had to settle into this fact that God is God and he's not. And that what God has for him is going to be better than anything he can manufacture. So then he nestles in and says, what is your name? He begins to ask God questions about who he is, not about what he can do for him. So when he first said, I won't let you go until you bless me, he was thinking about, all the stuff going on in his life. Esau's chasing after me. He might kill me. I haven't seen my father in 20 years. I had to work 20 years for a man that tricked me and changed my wages 10 times. The, can you imagine working for somebody and you don't know what you're going to make next week because they keep changing? That's what he was doing when he was working for his father-in-law. He was tired. He had a wife that he didn't really want to be with. He had strife in his home. He had to send his entire family and all his possessions across a brook as he waited for his brother to show up, not knowing if his brother was going to kill him or not. And he's like, I won't let you go until you make all this go away. And when the Lord touched him and disabled him and showed him, you can't beat me. God actually says, you've won. You have now prevailed. Wow. What a dichotomy. How does that work? We win by losing. We win by giving in. I'm going to tell you how this practically fits in just a minute. This is practical. I'm giving you the basis for a practical lifestyle. So after he wrestled, after he settled, because he saw he couldn't beat God, he couldn't win, he beheld him and just said, what is your name? Who are you? <laughs> and then he says, I have seen God face to face. That is the point of prayer. That is the point of life. That is the point of waking up in the morning. That is the point of all that you do. For you to meet God face to face. What am I meaning? Am I meaning that you're going to see a physical face that you can touch and all that? No. He's going to imprint on you his likeness. And all it takes is for you to engage. Don't just settle before you wrestle. And that's a good word. Some of us are settling before we wrestle. We're just like, okay, it's never going to change. I'm just going to have a, a, a faith where I just read the Bible every once in a while and it encourages me. 
Well, that's not, that's not, that's not the, the standard. The standard is to meet with God face to face. The standard is to know him. Remember Song of Solomon? This hide and seek is about a dance. You're searching for him, he shows up. You search for him some more, he shows up again. You, he's hiding from you, and you're trying to figure out what is, what is it? Where is he hiding this time? Is behind an idol in my life? Is behind the fact that maybe it's just not time yet? I'm going to give you a personal example. Today, I've been looking for him all day. I've been looking for him all day. Now, Frank, what do you mean? This is where I'm going to get practical. Please don't think this is difficult because it's really not. There are levels to presence. So let's look at um, the temple in the wilderness as an example. The temple had an outer court. First, it had a door. <laughs> okay. Then it had an outer court. It had an inner court. And it had an innermost court. So three levels. The door was for people who were in Israel. So anyone who was a Jew could get in the door. So think about it this way. If you're a Christian, if you say yes to Jesus, you're in the door. You're already in the door. OK, that's just waking up in the morning. You've given your heart to Christ, but you're in the outer court. So think about practically what that means to get to the inner court. You've got to walk that, that there's energy. There's a decision made there. What they did in the outer court was they received the, the uh, sacrifices of the people. So anyone could go into the outer court, but the inner court was reserved for the priest. And in the inner court was where the priests made the sacrifices. Oh, somebody hearing. Do you hear where we're getting? We're getting into the wrestling now. When I'm in the outer court, I'm just, I'm just in the family. Because I'm in the family, I'm in the outer court. But when I want to get closer to his presence, because his presence is in the innermost court. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was, which represents the manifest presence of God. So to get to the inner court, I've got to be willing to make a sacrifice. Simple example. Time. If I'm willing, willing to sacrifice my time, I'm going to wake up 30 minutes earlier. I'm going to wake up. God had me up this morning at 345 in the morning because he knew I would get up. He woke me up because he knew I would. I have that kind of relationship with him where I, I know sleep is optional. It's fine. It's fine. And some of us might say, what? Yes, because his tangible presence gives you the strength. How did Moses go up on Mount Sinai twice and not eat anything or drink anything for 40 days and 40 nights? Because he was in the presence of God. His presence was tangibly caloric. It sustained his body. And this is the depth of relationship the Lord has for you, too. This is not just for the Moseses of the world. And so we've got to believe he's that good, that he's not out to kill you. The people who were at the foot of Mount Sinai were afraid and said, no, you go up, Moses, because they were afraid God was going to kill him. We can't be like that. We've got to be like the beloved in the Song of Solomon. We're looking for him. Where is he? We're asking people, where is he? Um, so you're in the inner court where you're making sacrifices. What else can you sacrifice? Well, idols in your life. Sin. That's what the sacrifices were for. It, it obviously was a... Um, imagery of Jesus Christ suffering for our sins because the Bible says without shed blood there's no atonement for sin so it was a repetitive example of what Jesus was going to do so what does that mean Jesus has already done it for us so we don't need to go in and 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 you know lash ourselves and do all no no what we need to do is check our heart condition it's a heart issue it's not about me physically harming myself because I've I've made a mistake Jesus took all my sins away but I can still be habitually sinning. I can still be reaching for the wrong things. And so when I come to God and I'm wrestling like Jacob and I've been trying to do things in my own strength and do things my own way and it keeps coming up short and I'm dissatisfied. He says, come into the inner court, man. Bring it. Put it on the altar and let me help you kill it. I'll give you my heart so that you'll have the, the ability and the desire to kill that idol. And then what happens? You become clean spiritually and you can see him. It's not about whether or not he wants you close. It's about can you see him? Jesus Christ healed a blind man. It blows me away. He, he, he laid hands on the man's eyes and it, it didn't immediately heal him. He could see better, but he didn't see clearly. You can be in Christendom your whole life and still be seeing God dimly. 
So what did Jesus do? He came back again, touched him again. He said, wow, now my eyes are open. And it's okay. Like, I don't want anyone to feel condemned because this is not a condemning word. This is an exciting word that the Lord literally has set a table before you, a feast, a banquet to come and dine with him every single day. It is his desire for you to get to the innermost court every day. And that's how I live my life. I'll just tell you, if I don't weep in his presence, I feel like I haven't had a good day. When I don't feel broken to the point where nothing else in this world matters except being with him, I don't feel like I've had the best day that was available to me that day. And that's not a condemning feeling. It's, it's a hide and seek. It's me looking for him in the night. It's me looking for him in the streets. It's me in my car playing worship music saying, okay, Lord, what am I not giving up? What am I not giving up right now? That'll help me get into your presence. What is it? Is it my to do list? Sometimes that's for me. That's what it is. It's all the things I want to be doing. Sometimes it's misappropriated priorities. I set a meeting that I should have never set. It's too early in the morning. I should have set more time aside for the Lord that morning. Practical stuff. And what it is, we've just got to come into the knowing that there's no prize, no reward, no thing that can ever possibly do more for us than being in his manifest presence every day. Some of us are smoking cigarettes and the devil's using that as a counterfeit to the presence of God. Some of us are looking at pornography and it's a counterfeit to the presence of God. Some of us have problems controlling our eating habits. It's a counterfeit to, to the present. That satisfaction you get that's gone as soon as your stomach hurts and as soon as you step on the scale, it doesn't, you don't have that remorse with God. You will never be in the manifest presence of God and get out of it and say, man, I wish I hadn't done that. You will never have that experience. You know what you're going to feel like? You're going to feel like the counterfeit version of cocaine. Cocaine, they, they say you, you're always after the first hit. That is the dopamine representation of what the kingdom of God should be in your life. That once you get into his presence like that for the first time, you're like, I got to get back there ASAP. Man, I got to go to work. So let me serve you at work because then if I'm carrying you with me to work, I can be in your presence while I work. That is revival. That's when you're determined to carry the glory that you obtained because you would dare not not have it. You've got to be in the glory. You've got to love your neighbor because if I'm not loving my neighbor, all of a sudden I feel his presence is gone. You want to turn the other cheek because you know that if you act out of emotion and you do something back to somebody... That all of a sudden his presence is gone. Do you understand? Obedience comes from relationship. <laughs> it is the kindness of God that brings us to repentance. But see, the counterfeit version is discipline, discipline, consequences, consequences. Yes, there are consequences in the kingdom of God. But the only way we're going to have revival and live in his glory and be used for miraculous works. We read the book of Acts and we see all these things these cats did. We see what the... the the disciples did when the Lord said, go out two by two. That's the life that he's reserved for us, too. And it comes through relationship. It comes from sitting at his feet like Mary, wrestling with God like Jacob, settling into the fact that we can't beat him. We just need to give it up and then nestling into and abiding in his presence and carrying it with us. You will find yourself so more able to defeat sinful habits when you realize the cost is not a tummy ache. The cost is not being embarrassed because you have to confess to your wife what you did last night. The, the cost is not really going to rehab and having to spend $10,000 you could have spent some, somewhere else. The consequence really isn't having a DWI charge. The consequence really is that you're out of the presence of God. And so he allows you to be out of his presence long enough, hoping you will find him eventually by giving in through wrestling. And nestling into him. Wrestle, settle, and nestle. I pray this blesses you. I pray that you see the innermost court, which was reserved only for the high priest in the Old Testament, is now available to you. Because when Jesus hung his head and said, it is finished, the veil was torn. The access is now available to all of us. We've just got to seek it. And I got to tell you, one um, tangible example of how you know you've been in the innermost court is when you cry. When you weep because you're just, you're tasting him. You're tasting his presence. You're tasting his goodness. You're tasting how, oh my gosh, I don't want this to end. 
It's better than the best cheesecake. It's better than the most beautiful flower. All of these gifts he's given us in the earth, these are all gifts. Trees, seasons, all this stuff that he created was a gift to us to show us just the tokens. They're tokens of his affection, but they don't measure up to him. And all the things that the enemies brought into the world to counterfeit that blessing, to counterfeit that indelible, unquenchable thirst, um, uh, thirst giving relationship. It makes you thirstier. All those counterfeits, man, they will never satisfy. So let me pray for you um, so that you will begin to set aside a time, set aside time to wrestle and to finally say, okay, what is it, Lord, I need to give up right now? Is it just anxiety? Is it my stress over something? Or is it whatever? Is it a relationship that I know I shouldn't be in? Whatever. He will tell you. Just like he had a conversation with Jacob. He says, your problem is you're a trickster. But I call you one who wrestles with God. I call you a prince. Let him tell you who you are. <laughs> Thank you, God. We see your adoring eyes, Lord. We see your adoring eyes. Father, in Jesus' name, um, I'm just really excited um, for this word. And I'm just praying for whoever um, sees this, that this will begin a hide-and-seek adventure that will never end. Even in heaven, God, we're going to still be, we're still going to be seeking to get to the bottom of all you have for us. I'll never forget you described your heart as a bottomless ocean. We could never touch the bottom. <laughs> We'll spend our entire lives swimming, scuba diving, uh, doing all the whatever, beholding the wonders of your heart and still trying to figure out why you love us. Well, I mean, I'm so messed up. I can only speak for me. I think we all know we're messed up. But you, you gave your life so that I could have everlasting life now? You mean I can access your presence now? Wow. God, ignite a desire in us to get into the innermost court of your presence, the depth of your heart where you, just like you said through Asuerus to Esther, come into the throne room and ask me whatever you want, and I'll give it to you up to half of my kingdom. Wow. Help us to take on that mindset so that you can give us your heart through settling and nestling. So that when we ask, we're asking what you've already been prepared to give us. <laughs> and we're not just asking for things that are counterfeit versions of your love in this earth. I come against the spirit of deception that would want us to feel like this is uh, another hoop to jump through. God, this is the easiest thing ever. It just takes a desire. It takes a desire. And I speak that desire over everyone that's seen this today. Um, and I'm, in, I'm enamored with the thought, God, that you have created us to be fireflies emitting light all over the world. I bless your holy name. And uh, we impart a hunger and a thirst after righteousness that we will be filled. Until we meet again here, Lord Jesus, carry all of us through our day, giving us our daily bread on the greatest adventure of our lives, and that is you. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray this blessed you. Uh, think about sharing this with somebody. A lot of people, man, I think just need encouragement right now. God is with us, even in a, in a pandemic. I mean, he's, he's available. He is, he is sleeping on the ship waiting for us to come to him and receive the same peace that he has for us. God bless you. I love you. And uh, if you ever want to catch up with what we have going on, faithfireworldwide.com. In fact, we'll, um, we'll be praying at noon at Governmental Plaza in Greensboro on Friday. We have our uh, concert Friday night at 5 o'clock. The moment folk are getting out of uh, work, they're going to be hearing praise and worship music. And we're going to be there with free food from a food truck. First Christian Church in Kernersville is coming with that. We bless the Lord for them. We hope you can join us. And uh, anytime you can find us and, and look at our calendar on faithfireworldwide.com. In fact, uh, the Lord opened a door for us to preach this Sunday at Christ Wesleyan. Shout out to Pastor King Klein and his family. We love you. All right, till next time, we'll see you.